So hopefully you guys had some fun yesterday and last night. Um, and what we're going to do today and the rest of the week is actually dig into some of these topics a little bit more in depth. So we're going to use all the basic fundamental material science that we learned yesterday, and we're going to apply it to some more specific instances, okay? Well, this is basically what we'll do all week. So you're going to see concepts like the tetrahedron coming back in every lecture. You're going to, we're going to be talking about how bonding is related to certain properties that we're observing. We'll do more processing stuff today as well. Um, so hopefully you can start to identify some of the connections between all of these otherwise maybe random sorts of activities. Okay, so uh, to keep things interesting, the first thing we're going to do this morning is talk about fracture or breaking things, which is one of my favorite parts of engineering is breaking things. Um, and so uh, when you guys think of fracture, what do you guys think of? Bones? Yeah, that's the kind of fracture I don't like. Can't it? can't handle that. <laughs> what else? Anything else? Any other, other examples of what fracture means to you? Sorry? To break. To break? Sure. Any, like, specific examples? The bone was a good example. Yeah? A fracture of mirror. Fracture of mirror, yeah. It's, you know, fracture or shatter, yeah. Yeah, like when a big structure fails, it's usually at least starts with some sort of fracture and then it breaks into a whole bunch of parts. Yeah, those are all really good examples. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the whole idea of this lecture is to emphasize how we think about fracture and how we avoid fracture. Because effectively, fracture is the ultimate failure when it comes to engineering design. If you have something that fails via fracture, Somebody met, there's two things that happen. There's two ways that fracture still occurs, is that somebody messed up big time, or you put your material into a situation where it went beyond our understanding of how the material should behave, right? So there's only two real cases for this sort of failure. And the reason that fracture is so catastrophic is because it happens suddenly, right? When you fracture a mirror, there's not like a gradual process. It fractures. You can see like when your windshield fractures, they've engineered it so that it does it slowly and that actually took decades to figure out how to do it, right? So one of the most surprising examples, and, and our understanding of fracture behavior and fracture as a science is really not actually that old. So this, these are pictures uh, from World War II, which yeah, seems like it was a long time ago. Um, but basically, before World War II, actually, before the 1950s, we didn't know anything about fracture. We didn't know how to design for fracture. We didn't know how to predict fracture. Um, and we didn't, uh, we didn't know how to stop it, as evidenced by these boats that literally broke in half. These are full-size uh, Navy vessels. Uh, luckily, this one actually fractured in half in the harbor. Uh, this one was not so lucky. That's only half of the boat. The other half is gone literally fractured right in half because we didn't understand the connection between processing and geometry and our materials. Geometry plays a really big role in how failure like this initiates. And so that's kind of what we're going to learn today. We're going to play with this idea that geometry is going to be important in starting failure and propagating failure, but so are the properties of the material. Yesterday you guys talked about the Titanic, right? As another example of unexpected fracture and really lazy manufacturing, actually. It's more on the manufacturing than anything else. Uh, but no one would have predicted that because we didn't understand this as a phenomenon. It wasn't studied systematically. All right, so the reason that fracture happens, um, well, in general, when we think about failure, we already talked about how fracture is bad because it is a uh, catastrophic sudden failure, right? There are other modes of failure that are less dramatic, right? So when we think about failure, especially this could be in metals, it could be in glasses, it could be in polymers, it could be in just about any class of materials, we have two things that could happen. It can fracture like we already talked about, or it can gradually deform. And this is what we're going to call plastic deformation. When we talked about those dislocations moving around yesterday, how you move like one bond at a time and gradually move a defect through the structure, that is what we call plastic deformation. And that is what we prefer. That we can predict. And it's very gradual. Sometimes it takes a very long time to actually uh, get failure via plastic deformation. So you can see an example on this airplane that went through some sort of crazy hailstorm 
the nose cone is all dented in, but it's not, there's no cracks, there's no ruptures, there's no technical failure. It's just changed its shape. The windshield is a whole other story. The windshield is totally destroyed and won't be able to be used again, right? In theory, they could actually fix and repair this nose cone. I don't know if they did, but in theory, you could. All right, so this is what we're looking at. As engineers, we want this sort of failure rather than this sort of failure, because this we can recover, this we can fix, this we can predict, and this is slower, and this is much more difficult for us to predict. Okay, so what do you guys think determines whether or not a material fractures or deforms plastically? Is it going to go? Yeah, okay. The material, the type of material, the properties. What kind of properties are we thinking about? Like whether it's brittle or ductile? Any other ideas? The texture? how we're using it, maybe the temperature we're using it, the way that we're loading it, the way that we've designed it, how we processed it. You guys are catching on that these are words that I like. Good. All right. So um, the idea here is that of oh, the users, yes, yeah, the users can definitely induce fracture if they're not careful. So all of these things, the material, the processing, uh, and the properties, those are all, we spent a lot of time talking about this yesterday, those are all related to the type of bonding and the structure of the material. So we can influence all of these things with processing um, or by changing our chemistry. But effectively what happens in fracture is that if we think about, if I make all of my little atoms, so imagine you guys are out in your little flag football belts, and instead of those belts between you, you have springs now, right? And so those springs, the distance between atoms, there's some flexibility, right? I can move a little bit further away from my neighbor and be okay, but at some point I'm gonna to be too far away from my neighboring atom and I'm gonna to wanna to break that bond, all right? And so what happens when we fracture is that we break a whole bunch of these springs all at once. So you can see if, if we pull on it, those, those springs stretch and eventually they break and they all break at once. The, the dislocations and the, the gradual plastic deformation that we talked about, we only break one bond at a time, okay? So this is what's happening. All the bonds on one plane break all together. Okay, so if this is the case, so we know that the bond is important for dictating whether or not it's going to fracture or plastically deform, but somebody also said the, the, the use was important, or the users. Um, so if I asked you, uh, based on just these simple geometries, so this is a, just a bar, and this is a bar that has a, a little notch or a crack in it. So which of these two do you think is more likely to fracture? All right. So they both could fracture, but this one with the pre-existing flaw is more likely to fracture. So most of you guessed this right, but why? Anyone want to help us figure out why? What do you think? Sure, so if there's already crack there, then it makes sense that it would be easier for that crack to go further and break more of those bonds. That's really good logic. Anybody have any other ideas? That's the basic gist of it. Okay, so the other reason that we think about this is if I look back at this picture on a kind of a macroscopic scale, this is like a notch or something. It's not technically a crack yet, but it's certainly a lot sharper and pointier at the bottom of this than it is anywhere else on this. So what we're going to think about is we're going to think about, do you guys know what, how we define so, what stress is? Not, not like I need to study for a test stress, but, but the, the scientific engineering definition of stress. It's just a way that we normalize a force or a load, right? So stress, and we'll talk a lot about stress in mechanical deformation. Stress is just we take the force that we put onto a material and we normalize it by the cross-sectional area, right? And so if we do this, if I just have a regular bar, then my cross-sectional area is the whole cross-section of this rectangle. But if I put a notch there, now my cross-sectional area is a lot smaller, right? And so that means that my stress is going to be higher. And the higher the stress, the easier it is to deform or break my, those bonds. All right? 
And so the way that this, this stress is going to vary based on the geometry. Um, and these sorts of flaws, this is a nice toy example, but these sorts of flaws occur in all sorts of materials, especially on the surface. Um, when, uh, when we were casting yesterday, you guys were really careful about getting those bubbles out. Those bubbles can form on the surface, they can form on the surface of your object, and those surface flaws Okay, the, the polymer is not going to fracture, but if you are making a mold out of clay or plaster of Paris or something else like that, those could be sites where you could in, initiate a fracture. You also could get these sorts of surface flaws if you have to machine your parts. So you have to change the shape a little bit after you make it. Um, you could introduce flaws that way. There's a lot of different ways for these itsy bitsy tiny little flaws to initiate. You guys heard of that accident, the Southwest Air, uh, accident a month or two ago? Right? It was actually a really sad example. But what happened in that particular case is there was a little tiny flaw in one of the blades in the turbine engine. And actually, it was so small that they couldn't detect it. And the longer it operated, it grew undetected until it finally failed. Right? And so the size of these flaws, as well as their geometry, actually makes a really big difference in terms of uh, how it fails and when it fails. OK, so let's talk about how do we figure out when something does fail, what is it? plastic failure or was it fracture was it was it gradual fracture because some there are some materials that fracture but they fracture a little bit slower um, like oh never mind um, okay so let's see there's a couple different classifications of fracture so there's actually people there are engineers who their entire job is they are fractographers meaning they take uh, failure uh, failures either from the field or from a lab situation and they look at the fracture surface and they can figure out everything. They can figure out where the crack started. They can figure out how long it took to propagate. They can figure out uh, ways to improve the processing to avoid that sort of, of a failure. So this is actually kind of a, a little science in and of itself. Um, but for, the, for your purposes, we don't have to worry too much about that. We're just going to know that there are three primary modes of fracture, right? There's going to be what we're going to call ductal, ductal fracture, cleavage fracture, and intergranular fracture, right? And the, the big difference is, is that ductal fracture here happens a little bit more gradually. So we all know what ductal means. Yeah, it means it, it can, we can pull on it, we can change its shape a little bit, and then it will, deform, then it will fail. So we get a little bit of plastic deformation before fracture. These other two, cleavage and intergranular fracture, are going to be what we call brittle failure. And so what I'm plotting here on this is I'm showing you uh, stress. We talked about stress. So the higher the stress, the more likely it will be to fail. And strain. Does anybody know what strain is? All right, strain is like, who, who was testing the plastic bags yesterday? Yeah? And when you put the load on it, what changed about the plastic bag before it failed? It stretched. It got a lot longer. And when, when you took the load off, did it, did it go back to its original size or did it stay long? It stayed long. And so that's called strain. And so strain is another way of normalizing the change in dimension. So this type of strain is basically the change in length divided by the original length, right? And so the longer, so the further out you can go on this axis, that means the more you could deform the material without breaking it. So materials that are really strong are going to be up here, and materials that are really tough are going to go out here. We talked about that distinction yesterday. We'll, we'll remind ourselves of that definition in a, in a minute. But before we do that, all we need to know is that we've got ductal-like fracture and we've got brittle-like fracture, which could be cleavage or intergranular. We're going to skip the intergranular example today because uh, that's a little bit more difficult to diagnose. But Let's talk about what cleavage fracture looks like. So cleavage fracture is a brittle fracture, which means it's going to happen fast. Um, cleav the reason we call it cleavage fracture is actually it, it actually derives from the geologists. Um, like when they, when they shaped my diamond, they used concepts of cleavage, right? So cleavage just means effectively that we're going to separate a whole bunch of bonds on a well-defined plane, right? So we have this crystal structure over here. This isn't a super great crystal structure. But basically, when I cleave it, the crack goes right along one plane. So you can see on this side, this half of my material, all the atoms are nice and lined up. And on this side, they're all nice and lined up. And that crack goes right along one plane of atoms. Right? So we cleaved it into two parts. 
all right? And this happens really rapidly. And when we do this, we get surfaces that look like this. And this is a, what we call a micrograph. The scale bar is pretty small. Um, but the, the key point that you see here is that this doesn't look super smooth like this, but that's because we have to worry about the microstructure. There's still grains, and so not all of the crystals are oriented the same way, but it wants to fail on the same crystal plane no matter how it's oriented. So when it goes from one grain to the next, the crack actually has to twist and turn. And so this is what we call a river pattern, and you can actually figure out where the crack started based on the direction that the water flows. Actually, it's backwards. Uh, or no, it's, it's right. So a river would flow, all these little tributaries would flow down into one big crack, right? So this is a, a, a trick for us. If we're looking at a fracture surface, we want to know where it started. We're going to look for uh, where it converges and then go backwards. So it started somewhere over here, all right? So there are clues in these fracture surfaces that help us figure out how it failed and where it started. So the other type of fracture we're going to, sorry, are there any questions before I keep going? No? We're hanging in there? Okay. So the other type of fracture or failure we're going to talk about is ductal failure. Um, and so in this case, we talked about how there's a little bit of plastic deformation. It's going to change its shape a little bit, and then it's going to fail. And the reason this happens is, I don't know, can any of you see? So there's a big hole here in this fracture surface. Can any of you see what's sitting inside there? Right in there, there's a little ball, a little sphere, actually that is not metal, it's actually carbon, a little ball of carbon in there. And so in this particular case, our flaw wasn't necessarily a crack, it was a different particle. So the particle actually initiated the failure here. And so that's what the schematic is showing, is that if I have all these little particles in my metal, the particles don't deform because the particle, carbon is, kind of, is a lot more like a ceramic, so it doesn't want to stretch into form, but the metal wants to stretch into form. And as the metal stretches, then you get these little voids and gaps around it, and those gaps can link up, and eventually they form these big cracks as the voids link, which is why when we have a ductal fracture, it kind of doesn't go in a straight line. So if I, want, if I am breaking the material, I would expect the crack to go straight through, but it kind of meanders and does what it wants because it's really dependent on where these voids form and how they link up. So often one of the characteristics of ductal failure is a more zigzaggy sort of pattern. All right? So these are the sorts of things that we're looking for when we're trying to analyze fracture. And so these might be things that you consider if you get a piece out of the field and you want to figure things out. But we also do a lot of testing in the lab to be able to characterize the material and predict how it might fail under different situations. And in order to characterize it in a really systematic and rigorous way, we have standards. All right? There's a couple different types of standards. Um, but for fracture testing, we use a nice little equation like this, and all of these so this K here is what we're going to call the fracture toughness, all right? And all the rest of these parameters, with the exception of, of P here, are dependent on the geometry of my test specimen, okay? And so I can have, today we'll, we'll play with two different types of geometries. There are lots. Depends on what kind of material it is and the type of application you're using. We're going to use two different configurations. One is just called a single edge notch. And so basically what happens in this because I'm going to pretend, actually, I'll pretend that this is my specimen here, and then I'll show you an actual example of when it failed. If this is my specimen, I clamped it on the ends, and then I pushed down in the middle, and it broke in the middle, right? So I put a, a crack here in the middle to help it get started so I would know where it would fail, and then I pushed in the middle, and that's where it fails. And so this is an example of uh, one of these types of geometries here. So you can see... This part right here was where they originally had the notch, and then the crack propagated over there. And in this particular case, the metal was tough enough that it didn't actually break all the way through, so it's still connected on that backside. The crack eventually stopped. And then we also have, we'll, we'll play a little bit with this one. This one we won't do as many tests with, but we also have something called a compact test specimen, and that's just because there's a little bit more fracture surface, so sometimes it's easier to analyze. Oh, so I promised to show you an actual test specimen. So this is actually, a, uh, a 3D printed uh, polymer. Um, my husband gave this to me. This is actually one of his undergrads is working on this over the summer. Um, and they, they loaded it exactly like this. They put it in three-point bend, and you can see it permanently deformed. It failed. But it also, the crack in this particular case didn't go necessarily straight, and that had to do with the structure. Because this was 
uh, additively manufactured. We'll talk more about additive manufacturing and 3D printing on Thursday. But if you take a close look at this, you can see how the crack kind of follows the lines on the surface, and that has to do with some of the structure. Okay? You can take, you can take a look at this if you want. Just be careful. Don't break it all the way. Um, his under guy will be mad at me. It's kind of his trophy. Um, <laughs> okay. So this is, what, this is the types of specimens that we can use. So before we actually break anything, we're going to think about uh, why the things would break. And so we're going to explore this idea of stress and how stress is going to be dependent on the geometry by using a computational modeling tool called finite element analysis. Finite element analysis or finite element modeling is a tool that's used ubiquitously across a wide range of engineering disciplines. It's used extensively in mechanical, aero, and civil engineering, but it's also used in bioengineering to analyze uh, stress distribution and implants and other sorts of things. So this, this tool is very generic. It's not specific to material science, but we can use it to identify potential points of failure. So that's what you guys are going to get to do. We'll go up to the computer lab, and we'll build this, this model, and we'll play with a couple different geometries. And so one of the cool things about this age of material science is the real integration of computational tools and experiments, right? Computers can teach us things that are very difficult to test experimentally. They can do things super fast. They can do lots of iterations that are really expensive or time consuming for me to do in the lab. And they can discover things that I would have a hard time finding as an experimentalist. Or they can help me explain some of my experiments when I don't understand them. So this idea, what you're seeing here, this blue square is kind of like how my sample would be if I left it alone. Blue means there's no stress. Right? As I start to bend it, the colors change. And the color is an indicator of higher and higher stresses. So this hot spot right here at the tip of my crack is where the stresses are going to be the highest. And so that's probably going to be where it fails. So you guys will have a chance to play around with this a little bit. And then we will actually do some experiments, except we're going to do experiments with cheese, because cheese is a lot easier to make uh, and break than metal. But it behaves surprisingly similar to metal in terms of what those fracture surfaces look like. So we're going to look for things like those river patterns. We're going to look for things like voids and zigzaggy uh, fracture paths. And we can see the differences based on the properties of the cheese that actually emulate different classes of metals. So this would be like this cheese over here is called Munster cheese. Um, this would be more like aluminum. And this cheese, this is extra sharp cheddar. It'd be more like a cast iron or a tungsten or something like that. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? No? So uh, fracture is both uh, linked with structure and properties. Uh, so it's a fracture is a fracture property, and we can manipulate it uh, really due to the structure of the bonds as well as the microstructure. 